Well, hello everyone. Um, I guess as we're all kind of quarantined in our homes at the moment, um, I figured it'd be a good opportunity to um, go ahead and make this presentation, get this posted to the discussion board, and go from there. So my name is Joseph Lamb. I'm here today uh, to talk a little bit about structure activity relationships and medicinal chemistry. And it's a really, really interesting field uh, because it really focuses on the concept of uh, the fact that structure determines function. And that's something that I've talked quite a bit about in uh, chemistry. We talk about biochemistry, uh, even in uh, my, uh, when I taught regular biology, we teach, uh, we talk a lot about how the structure of a particular molecule determines its function. And that's the way with medicinal and organic chemistry as well. The structure of the molecule itself determines what it does. And the more information that we know about that, the more we can synthesize novel molecules. Um, to be able to treat illnesses and to be able to cure diseases. So super exciting stuff. Let's move on. Um, you know, as with any presentation that I do, I've got um, going to be doing this quite a bit now <laughs> with the uh, circumstances. But um, uh, I wanted to post some learning objectives here. So hopefully you'll understand uh, what is meant by a library of molecules, explain basic structure activity relationships, detail how libraries are synthesized, evaluate reactions, uh, related to medicinal chemistry and discover implications for drug discovery. So a little bit about medicinal chemistry. Uh, medicinal chemistry is the application of organic chemistry to produce pharmaceutical agents and drugs. So basically we're taking the concepts that we've learned about organic chemistry and synthesizing molecules and figuring out how that applies to medicine and how that applies to biology and how we can create medicines and things like that to be able to treat diseases. Um, interestingly enough, pharmaceutical agents and drugs are divided into uh, different classes. Uh, these are made of small organic molecules, and they're made of similar organic molecules. Classes typically have a similar base structure and with similar properties. So on the right-hand side here, um, I wanted to show you some differences in some antibiotics. Uh, and mostly, I guess you should say similarities as opposed to differences. But you can see um, in the psyllin family, you have uh, penicillin G, you have amoxicillin and ampicillin, just a couple of examples there, and you can see how very similar the structures are. Um, the key structure is essentially the area around the beta-lactam ring. It's that four-membered lactam that's in the uh, center of the molecule there. I'll circle that now. Um, but you can kind of see the, the basic structure here, that penicillin, that kind of that core structure, and how important that structure truly is. Um, anything else that we add to it can can alter how it behaves uh, when it interacts with a bacteria and therefore can change its function based on all of the different ligands that you can add to it. Um, these particular antibiotics work by inhibiting bacterial cell biosynthesis and this is lethal on bacteria and interestingly enough um, bacterial resistance occurs when uh, one of some of the genes in bacteria can activate something called beta lactamase which is a class of enzymes that can actually break open that ring. So a little bit about structure activity relationships. Uh, structure determines function. That is basically the kind of the key message here with this particular presentation. This was presented by Crumb, Brown, and Fraser in 1865. Um, and the structure of the compound determines the biological effects it has. So uh, I, on the right-hand side here, I actually, uh, this is colchicine, which is used to inhibit mitosis. So not really a... Uh, necessarily a, uh, a pharmaceutical drug per se, but you can see here how all of the different structures that are here actually uh, play a role in how colchicine behaves. So you can see here certain groups uh, are important for binding ability, some are not required. Uh, for correct confirmation activity, sometimes ligands need to be added uh, just in order to get the confirmation correct. So the discovery of new drugs is a very long and complex process. Um, the discovery of new chemical compounds are known as hits, and they're often found by observing biological activity. So uh, scientists will observe biological activity inside of animals, plants, fungi, I mean, you name it. If it's living, they'll observe the activity on it and look at what a particular compound does. Um, sometimes these are also found from repurposing compounds that already exist as drugs. Sometimes drugs are repurposed for, for new things based off of how it behaves inside of the body. Um, the observation of how organic compounds bind with receptors and proteins plays a role in this as well. And these fragments can be synthesized into larger compounds. So you know, we, we give these large group of molecules um, that we're looking at and we're observing. And uh, a few of them end up becoming hits. These are things that are biologically active. They do something inside of the body. And we want to be able to either replicate that uh, or harness the ability for the molecule to do that in order to fill some type of medicinal need, per se. So when we get hits, we need to 
take into consideration the concept of structure libraries. Now, medicinal chemists keep quantities of hit compounds in a chemical library. This allows for further testing, optimization of compounds, and synthesis. Most laboratories focus uh, on a specific type of organic compound to work with. They're not um, you know, working on lots and lots of different things simultaneously. Um, a lot of times it's very, very specific, and that's to keep down cost. Therefore, libraries focus on keeping and synthesizing only the compounds that are essential for the development of a particular compound or two or however many they're looking at. Um, these can include chemicals that are used to synthesize hit or lead compounds. We'll talk about lead compounds in a minute. The hit compound themselves and variations of that. Lead compounds and variations catalysts and solvents, and ligands that may be used to alter hit or lead compounds. So they're really looking at focusing on the specific library itself that they're going to use to optimize the drug, to take that hit compound, turn it into a lead compound, and then continue the optimization process. So we have our hit, now what's next? Well, there's lots of different things that take place here. Uh, confirmatory testing to check to see if the activity is reproducible. So now that we have a hit, um, can we make that compound in lab? Concentration testing for bioavailability and binding capability. Uh, synthetic tractability, evaluation of compounds according to their actual ability to produce on a larger scale. So is this something that we could viably produce large scale to, uh, to make that drug? Biophysical testing, uh, lots of other tests used to determine whether uh, the compound binds effectively to the target. Evaluation of kinetics, thermodynamics, stoichiometry of binding, see if there's any conformational changes, you know, if the, the drug changes itself into something that is inactive or changes itself, changes itself into something uh, that could be harmful for the body. That's something that's important for uh, medicinal scientists to know. Hit ranking and clustering. Confirmed hit compounds are ranked according to their effectiveness and um, freedom to operate evaluation as well. Hit structures are checked to determine if they are patentable. If it's something that's already been discovered, then you know no reason to patent it. So after a hit compound is discovered, it's manipulated into a lead compound, and this is basically optimization of the compound itself. So now that we actually know that we're able to synthesize this, we know that this actually works inside of the body, um, how can we optimize it uh, to improve the efficiency of the compound, reduce side effects, off-target activity? We want the specific compound to work for one specific thing. How do we prevent it inside of the body from uh, doing things we don't want it to do? And uh, that takes time, takes money, just like everything else that we're discussing. So just some long-term implications for this, just some things that kind of random stuff that I've stumbled upon with my research. You know, when we look at these particular uh, this particular setup, this allows for classes of drugs. We change a few groups, we change a few ligands, and what we end up with is a new drug. Uh, it's a drug that will be very similar, but it uh, the, the bacteria, the viruses, you know, whatever we're looking at uh, may not have a resistance to it. So that's why we keep creating new antibiotics. I shouldn't say we create new antibiotics, but we keep synthesizing ones that are similar to ones that we've done previously, but have a couple functional groups changed or, um, again, a few ligands removed or added here and there. Uh, the development of a drug is very capital intensive, uh, roughly costs about $1.8 billion per new drug. Uh, something that I came across, and this is an interesting area of discussion, is orphan drugs and conditions. Uh, orphan drugs are drugs that work on uh, something, a disease that is very rare, um, and that goes for orphan conditions as well. And so if we think about it from a business perspective, it's not very cost effective to develop drugs for rare conditions, and that's one of the reasons why those drugs are particularly expensive. Um, in many countries, they actually subsidize, the, the government subsidizes the development of drugs, of orphan drugs for rare conditions. Um, new reactions in medicinal chemistry are actually rare. There have been no new discoveries in the last 20 years, and these are reactions that are used to synthesize compounds for medicinal chemistry. The reaction toolbox for this is actually relatively small. Uh, 123 different reaction types accounted for 95% of the reactions, which increased to 159 over 35 years, but this growth has stagnated over the past 10 years. So there are definitely some implications for this. Certainly, the more the larger the reaction toolbox is, the more likely we are to synthesize compounds that would be able to be used as drugs inside of the body. And if the toolbox stays small and no new or no new reactions are able to be used to create new drugs, that's certainly problematic as well because that could certainly inhibit the uh, creation of new drugs to be able to cure and treat diseases. So lots of really interesting implications here for this particular uh, project. I've just attached the works cited page to this. Uh, again, uh, really interesting topic here about medicinal chemistry and just the idea of you know, how the synthesis process works because it certainly 
a very intensive process. It's not something that happens very quickly. And as we kind of think about what's going on in the world today, when we think about coronavirus and we think about um, you know the, the the development of a vaccine, which I'm sure is a, a very similar process as well, uh, the development of antiviral drugs to be able to treat this particular illness, you know, definitely lots of questions that I think could be uh, discussed with this particular topic. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the video. I appreciate uh, your time. Have a great day, and we will see you guys soon. Have a great day, guys. Bye bye.